This year, for Valentine's Day, we're doing away with the typical sappy romantics. Instead of looking at a tale of lost love, or the odd coupling of a sadomasochistic yakuza and his mob boss, we're turning to a different type of love. A type that anyone can experience, regardless of orientation, relationship status, or sexual proclivity. For Valentine's Day 2018, cozy up by yourself or with a loved one, or ones, and let's take a look at a different kind of love letter, this time to the phenomenon of fandom. Today's episode was requested by YouTube user Chan EX, along with a number of other titles that we'll be getting to at some point later in the year. Thanks for the suggestions. Given the nature of our present topic, we're talking about another proper anime, and only two weeks after our first anime episode. I'm not sure proper is how I would describe this one. Fair enough. Otaku no video is, uh, well, it's a bit out there. Released in 1991, Otaku no Video is a two-part original video animation, or OVA. The OVA is a phenomenon within anime that was sparked largely by the introduction of home video. Completely skipping the television market, these short to medium length productions were first issued directly on VHS and later DVD. This accounts for the often odd runtimes of OVAs, which are typically not short enough to fit within a half-hour TV block, but also not long enough to warrant a theatrical release. Collectively, both parts of Otaku no Video run at about 100 minutes, making the pair more or less feature length. Each half sits at about a 50-minute runtime, placing them, as per usual with OVAs, in a weird middle ground. The two-part OVA follows the exploits of Kubo, a prim and proper tennis enthusiast who happens upon an old friend from high school, Tanaka. As it turns out, Tanaka has become a full-blown otaku, a term which is nowadays more or less synonymous in the West with anime fan, but which 30 years ago extended to any sort of fandom. Slowly but surely, Tanaka corrupts Kubo into becoming an otaku himself, and the two, along with their ragtag band of fellow otaku, strike out on one business venture after another. What follows is a series of scenarios which escalate in ridiculousness, as Tanaka and Kubo strive to become the Otaking, the king of all otaku. Otaku no Video is split between animated portions which follow this storyline throughout the 1980s and live-action interviews supposedly taken with real otaku in the early 90s. According to one of the commentary tracks provided on Animego's 2016 reissuing of the film, it was long believed that these interviews were genuine, given how convincing and, frankly, bizarre they come off. However, as those commentating explain, the interviewees were in fact employees of the production company behind the project, Gynax. Yeah, you know the one. All of these segments were scripted in a way which, when juxtaposed with the ridiculous antics of the main plot, lovingly draws attention to some of the more absurd elements of otaku culture in that decade. It's interesting as a time capsule, but also presents scenarios which should fascinate anyone who studies fandom. Speaking of that 2016 re-release, we would like to give a colossal thank you to Animego for providing us with a Blu-ray copy of the film. The company kickstarted the remaster in 2015 to overwhelming success, and has released Otaku no Video on DVD and two different Blu-ray versions. It's a great set, with the basic Blu-ray edition containing a pretty hefty patch. Yeah, that one's going on my jacket. On the disc, you've also got the options to watch both OVAs in their entirety, just the animation, or just the interview segments. Oh, that's really cool. Heck yeah, man. Plus, there are two commentary tracks included from those involved in the production of the project, and an additional one from the Americans at Animego who localized Otaku no Video. And if you're really feeling saucy, there's a premium edition Blu-ray set, which includes not one but two art books, showcasing pre-production artwork and even a timeline of events in the film. Once again, thank you so very much, Animego, for making this episode substantially easier to produce. Thank you. So, about that timeline of events. You see, while Otaku no Video is primarily an irreverent ode to the nature of otaku and their culture through the 80s and early 90s, under the surface it contains a veiled autobiography of its creators. Gainax began its life as two separate companies known as Daikon and General Products. Now, this might be a little confusing, so just bear with us. Daikon, the company, before being named Daikon, produced two animations for the opening ceremonies of two conventions, respectively named Daikon 3 and Daikon 4. The animations produced were also called Daikon. So, the timeline goes, Daikon the convention has animated intros called Daikon, produced by a group of people who would later form the company called Daikon, who would later form the company called Gynax. 
If that doesn't make any sense, then we're probably on the right track. The Daikon 3 and 4 events, held in Osaka in 1981 and 1983, saw the first major successes for soon-to-be Daikon, soon-to-be Gainax. Even these opening animations were full of references to other anime that the founders of Gainax loved at the time. In a scene of Otaku no Video, where Tanaka is exposing Kubo to the world of the otaku, he actually shows these animations on VHS. The other company which eventually merged with Gainax, General Products, was an early success story in the field of garage kits. These kits are designed for in-home use without the need of manufacturing equipment for molding and sculpting figures. Garage kits first started cropping up in the 1980s, but many garage kit companies did not acquire licenses to produce models of popular characters from anime and film. General Products, however, did acquire these licenses beginning in 1982. This led to a boom in their popularity. Wait, do Japanese houses even have garages? That's a... that's a really good question. Recognizable characters of the time, such as Ultraman, some of the mechs from Gundam, and Godzilla himself could all be found in the General Products roster. Looking back to Otaku no Video, in the same scene of Kubo's introduction to the world of Otaku, we see a number of models strewn about the room, including Godzilla, perhaps as an homage to Gainax's own beginnings. Thus, the plotline of Kubo, Tanaka, and friends founding their own anime and garage kit companies are fairly true to life. In fact, the names of these companies are only slightly changed in Otaku no Video. General Products becomes Grand Prix, often shortened to simply GP, such as its real-world counterpart. Gainax, which has been cited as a nonsense combination of a colloquial pronunciation of giant and the letter X, thus becomes Giant X within the OVAs. These thinly veiled similarities speak to the autobiographical nature of Otaku no Video, but they certainly do not begin or end with these two examples. Tanaka, Kubo, and the rest of the gang who found Giant X are all said to be based on Gainax employees or people that they knew. Their character traits, interests, and supposedly even their physical appearances are more or less hyperbolic representations of real people. The same can be said for this setting, with a lot of the locations being drawn from real places in Tokyo. Even the theme park that Kubo and Tanaka dream up could be an oblique reference to parks set up by Japanese film studios, namely the Toei Kyoto Studio Park, which opened its doors in 1974. In keeping with this, there are also a multitude of visual and verbal references to anime and tokusatsu, or special effects, TV series of the era throughout Otaku no Video. There are so many, in fact, that for each reference we were able to catch, four more stood subtly in the frame as well. We'll include a link in the description to Animego's notes on the series, where they list off all the references they picked up on. Some have called Gainax one of the first postmodern anime studios, given that they have included references to other anime, rather than remaining at arm's length from their contemporaries and influences since day one. So this type of laundry list of references should come as no surprise to fans of their other works, especially given that Otaku no Video provided the perfect environment for these references and callbacks with its inherent meta nature. The point of Otaku no Video seems to have been to have an irreverent laugh both at and with the otaku culture that Gainax had helped to proliferate throughout the 1980s. Where previous generations of animators had been trained as artists, who sought to elevate their craft for the sake of art, Gainax was the forerunner of the by otaku for otaku generation. They had grown up on these earlier shows and films and wanted to create more of what they wanted to see. They were interested in what they thought was cool rather than what would necessarily gain them respect as artists. In fact, the name Gainax, like we said, Giant X, is said to have been chosen simply because it sounded cool, with no deeper meaning whatsoever. Effectively, they were talented artists, no doubt, but at their hearts, they were nerds and fanatics who fundamentally shifted the culture and the media upon which the culture has drawn for the past 30 or 40 years. 
In some respects, this backfired, with some otaku and international fans taking ingress with the interview segments. In fact, it has been noted that the foreigner seen in one of these segments was simply told to talk on camera, rather than being given a script like the Japanese Gainax employee seen elsewhere. His lines were then dubbed over with unrelated, pre-scripted commentary that made him seem like a maniac obsessed with Japan in a manner which comes off as not necessarily healthy. This, in turn, severely upset the man being recorded, as well as the two Americans who worked with General Products, from whose names his pseudonym was taken. This could simply be an instance of the creators taking a joke too far, but it is a glaring oversight which deserves mention. Speaking of which, this next part of the episode is a little strong-natured, so tread lightly. Outside of this misstep, we have a hypothesis as to why Gainax was so interested in taking the piss out of otaku culture in 1991. A few years prior, a man by the name of Tsutomi Miyazaki, no relation mind you, was arrested and charged with the murders of four young girls in Saitama between 1988 and 1989. His crimes involved necrophilia, cannibalism, and vampirism, and his father was so taken aback by his son's eventual conviction that he committed suicide rather than face the world. However, most news media reporting at the time did not focus heavily on just how heinous Miyazaki's crimes were. Rather, they focused on his massive collection of VHSs, with some sources citing a number over 5,000, which largely contained, you guessed it, anime. Tsutomi Miyazaki's arrest helped to promote the stereotype throughout the population of Japan that otaku were fanatics in all the wrong ways. These stereotypes saw otaku being labeled as antisocial, which in turn led to their association with hikikomori, young people who are noted for their prolonged periods of being shut-ins. While these stereotypes may have relaxed by now thanks to the passage of time and the promotion of otaku culture via the internet, in the early 90s this was a very real stigma that those who claimed status as otaku faced. Prior to Miyazaki's arrest, they were seen largely as quirky weirdos, but for a time they became known as potentially dangerous weirdos. Otaku no Video plays off of these recent stereotypes in both the main storyline and the interviews. The anime segments show that Kubo initially holds Tanaka and his otaku friends to be strange and uncomfortable, but that over time he grows fond of them and their culture. This could be said to display an understanding of the innocuous perception of otaku in the 1980s. The interviews, meanwhile, and their accompanying infographics supposedly drawn from polls of otaku attempt to display otaku in a contemporary light as the fractured individuals that popular media might paint them as. In a brilliant act of subversion, however, quite the opposite is achieved. The interview subjects are largely displayed as either being so entrenched in their otaku fandom that they don't perceive the negative conditions in which they live, or as respectable career people who more or less regret their time as otaku. However, it's notable that these interviewees have a number of positive traits which are downplayed by how they are framed. For instance, a programmer who it turns out is ashamed of his otaku past, and who is in fact still a closeted otaku, is subtly shown to be highly intelligent. Through his speech, it's obvious that he is educated and he has a respectable job. The interviewer, however, focuses solely on his closeted status. The foreigner mentioned before explains that he came to Japan after falling in love with the culture. It is spun so that he seems like an unhinged fanatic who wishes that he were born Japanese. In fact, we learn that the man has more or less played the system, coming over as a Christian minister in order to further entrench himself in the culture that he loves. Another interview is conducted inside a cramped apartment filled with VHSs, not unlike the images called to mind when discussing Tsutomi Miyazaki's living conditions prior to his arrest. This man is asked about the pragmatism of accumulating so many tapes, which he admits to never viewing again once they are recorded. Instead, they are intended as part of his collection. This pokes fun at the absurd nature of collecting anything, while diverting our attention from the man's drive and punctuality in recording these shows at their set times. All of these interviews seem to be spun in a negative way. They seem to be attempting to understand the otaku phenomenon from the perspective of someone who has never taken part in the culture. In some ways, they feel like documentary TV shows which revolve around niche cultures. Yet, there is an inherent bias in how the information and interviews are presented, with otaku being displayed as unstable or fanatical in a negative way. As we have hopefully demonstrated, however, we believe that this was intended as a way of poking fun at the quirks of the culture, while also calling attention to how otaku were portrayed following Miyazaki's arrest. These people are almost entirely harmless, and in fact we can see that they're brilliant, competent business people and inclusive lovers of their culture. 
Sure, they're not always the most self-aware, but that could be said to be the whole conceit of otaku no video, calling attention to the absurd aspects of otaku culture while still proclaiming, I love this, rather than shooting it down. Otaku no video is certainly a strange case. It's an absurdist comedic tale of bonds forged through fandom, a love letter to the culture that helped create Gainax, and which Gainax helped to proliferate, a potentially offensive exploration of the otaku fandom, and, as one of the commentators on Animego's release put it, a double retrospective, a valuable time capsule which was produced in the 90s while detailing the 80s, then reissued in modern day. Give this one a watch if you haven't. Those who aren't too keen on anime may not be very fanatical about it, but it's an interesting watch for its content, its style, and its experimental nature. If you're a fan of anime, especially that hailing from the 80s, and which influenced Gainax's signature postmodern style, you'll probably appreciate it all the more. We're so glad you could spend Valentine's Day with us this year. Whether you're in a relationship or single, whether you claim to be an otaku or you're just your average Joe who stumbled onto this video, whatever the case, thank you for joining us, and remember that there's no shame in being a weirdo, because just like Kubo, Tanaka, and the others, you will find a group if you're looking. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone.